You're listening to The Thrive Podcast, where every week we dive into a practical, tactical tip to bring you from a life of simply surviving to thriving. It's personal development for the everyday girl who is done with coasting through her days, done with feeling like she's missing out on the deeper meaning of her own life, and done with mediocrity once and for all. Because it's not enough to simply survive, you deserve to thrive. Welcome back to Thrive. Sex trafficking and exploitation has increased 40% since the pandemic. There are an estimated 750,000 predators online at any given time. There are currently 40.3 million people enslaved in the world. That's roughly one in every 200 people. Human trafficking is a hard reality in our world today, but we're hoping to shine a light in the darkness and spark an important, necessary conversation. My friend Chandler was made victim of a sex trafficking attempt in Miami, and she is bravely and boldly sharing her story with us today so that we can all become more informed on the horrific reality that trafficking is in our world and in our country. Chandler also shares some important personal safety tips that she has since learned and put into practice to stay alert, how to teach her kids and keep them as safe as possible, and she's sharing the best ways to get involved in your own community so that we can stop trafficking together. Stay tuned through this conversation. Drop it five stars if you like what you're listening to. And now, welcome Chandler. Hi. (laughs) I'm so glad to be here. (laughs) Yes. Hi. Hello. I feel like um, the conversation is going to be maybe a bit uncomfortable for some, but so very necessary for so many. So I am truly thrilled and honored that you agreed to come on Thrive. Um, but before we dive into all the deep stuff, let's hear all about you because you and I first connected after a personal development conference, what, like a couple years ago at this point. Yeah. Yeah. But you're such a bundle of light and joy and amazing energy. So please introduce yourself and who you are and what you do before we hop into, um, the big reason why you're here. Well, first of all, Erica, that like means the world coming from you because I feel the exact same way. And I actually, this is the first time that we are sitting face to face ish. Like it's yeah. nice to meet you. So I feel just like you've been my internet friend for so long. So this is so fun for me. Um, so my name is Chandler Hatchett. I am um, 33 years old. I'm a mother of two little ones, a boy who is about to turn seven and my daughter who um, is three and a half and she's very proud of her half. And um <laughs> <laughs> yes, we live in Austin, Texas, where I grew up. We just moved here in the middle of the pandemic from Dallas. Um, and my history, I guess, is I started a lifestyle and wellness blog years and years and years ago that really talked about um, wellness, holistic wellness, and how spirituality and faith really, they align, the two of them align, and why it's important to, you know, take care of your physical body as well as your spiritual um, body. And so that is where I kind of began. And that's why I was at that conference. I was just relaunching as a ministry in 2019, which was the perfect time to launch a small business. Mm -hmm. And um, yes, it, it has changed quite a bit, not only because of the pandemic, but um, because I, I went through something pretty traumatic in 2020, at the end of 2020 as well, um, that has completely changed what I believe is my purpose and my passion. And it's changed my voice for, for the rest of my life. I'll just never be the same. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. <laughs> yeah. So basically you are a survivor of a human trafficking attempt, which is like, crazy, but you're doing so much good as an anti-trafficking ally in the world today. So I'm so sorry that you went through something so horrible and so horrifying, but wow, kudos to you for taking something that was so traumatic and trying to turn it into something that could benefit the world in some way. So kudos, but the floor is yours to share your story. Yeah. So I'm actually going to go back to to the beginning of 2020, um, in January, February of 2020, I went to a conference led by a woman named Christine Kane, who um, she is this amazing evangelist. But she also runs an organization called A21, and it's an anti global anti trafficking organization. Um, and when I was at that conference, I had a really big spiritual experience, really great spiritual awakening for me, and um, just felt the Lord. I'm, I'm clearly uh, faith is a big deal for me. So I talk about (laughs) it a lot. (laughs) 
Um, just felt the Lord that week really put on my heart to learn more about trafficking and what that looks like and to um, get involved. And so I started just donating to A21 while I was there. I um, signed up for monthly donations and decided I would just learn more about it. Um, it is something I've always known was going on in the background. Didn't really care to to read about it because I thought, you know, this is so far outside of my scope, outside of my life. Um, also, it's really sad and it's really scary, but like I'm not a 20, 21 year old traveling through Europe. So it's not going to affect me or my family. Well, my daughter and I will have conversations about it when she's older. It's kind of how I left it. So when I started researching, especially during the pandemic, I went down like the rabbit hole and really started learning and learning about which organizations were, you know, really serving survivors and victims and which organizations were going in and pulling people out. I mean, that's a, that's a whole different level, specifically in Europe and in Asia, going in and pulling these people out. And I just learned a lot and I call it the rabbit hole of doom because it's very dark it's a very dark realization. And so between the, the heaviness of the pandemic and then me realizing that this world was scarier than I thought, I got to like September and um, just felt the Lord nudging me to talk about it. And, and, and I didn't want to, I was like, listen, God, I have enough anxiety as is like, I, I'm just not there. Um, Oh, that's my dog talking to me. So <laughs> she agrees. Sorry, everybody. Um, so fast forward October, 2020, and I have been planning my sister's bachelorette party in Miami. And because of the pandemic, we didn't want to go out to bars or clubs or anything like that. So I kind of brought the, I brought the party in. So we had pajama parties and one night we did a karaoke party in there and um, we had enough girls that the entire 23rd floor of that hotel belonged to us except for two rooms which we knew were vacant. I mean they told us. And the hotel was super secure. It was a five-star hotel in the nicest part of Miami. So we never really worried about safety being an issue. You had to have a key to a room on a certain floor. Like you couldn't even press a floor number. You like scanned your key kind of Vegas style. And it says, go to elevator B and elevator goes up to whatever floor you're on. So like we knew we were the only people in the hotel with keys to our rooms other than the staff, you know, to come in and deliver clean or anything. So it was super safe, never worried about it. And, um, that day we did leave the hotel. We went to a, um, on a boat ride. And when we were on the boat ride, uh, right before we went on the boat ride, I had this like overwhelming feeling that I needed to just pray for safety. And um, I, that's not really, I, I do pray like, Lord, keep my kids safe, keep me safe. But I don't ever like feel this fearful need to pray for, for God's safety and like a hedge of protection over us. I felt it so bad. And so almost to the point where I was afraid that the boat was a dangerous place to go because I was feeling this on like the car ride over to the boat. I even prayed, dear Lord, please don't let the boat driver be a trafficker and just take us all. I mean, I even prayed that, um, even though I knew most trafficking situation, 99% of trafficking stories do not come from crazy abduction stories, even though my, my story is one of those. So we got on the boat, everything was great. And we, we were driving past these shipping containers and I walked up to my sister and a group of girls and I just had this thought, like, I wonder how many of those shipping containers are filled with people coming from other countries uh, or anything like that after what I had been researching and learning. And so I was the Debbie Downer in the group who mentioned how many of those you think are filled with people. And they all looked at me like, we're not, we don't want to go there. This is a fun party. So drop it. And I was like, okay, I won't, I won't talk about it anymore. The boat ride was great. We got back to the hotel and that night we had a pit bull themed <laughs> pajama party. We all had matching pajamas. I got everybody bald caps and we were like dancing the pit bull songs and eating pizza. And about halfway through the night, and this was early, it was like eight o'clock at night. I got this horrible migraine, terrible migraine. I never get migraines ever. Um, to the point where I turned to one of my sisters and I said, you know, I am... Um, I'm going to go, I'm going to go lay down. I don't feel well. I was, I was starting to feel sick from my head hurting. It's a loud room was the last place I wanted to be. 
So I walked down the hall, um, 30 to 50 feet down the hall, not very far. And, um, went into my room and turned off all the lights in the bathroom and sat on the floor of the shower and let the water run over my head. And a few minutes after that, I heard my sister, cause my sister and I were sharing a room. She came in the room and I watched her like shadow cross across the bat, the opening of the bathroom. Cause all the lights were off and the light was on in the bedroom. And I thought, okay, well, she must be just grabbing something. Um, and just kind of had this uneasy feeling that like my sister was checking on me, but she wasn't saying anything. And I just remember thinking, okay, this is kind of weird. And about seven or eight minutes later, I heard a knocking on my door and I heard the knocking turned to pounding. And I thought, this is really strange. Um, and so I thought, why is it my sister answering the door? The only one, the only person who'd be pounding on my door would be one of my sisters or my mom, right? Because that's just how family is. So I got up knowing who it was. I didn't even grab a towel. I was completely naked and wet and um, opened the door. And my mom was standing there and my sister, who I thought was in the room with me. And I thought, well, maybe she had left. That's so strange. I never heard the door slam. So they, they were there to check on me are you okay? Carly said you had a migraine. And I'm saying there, I, I, I'm okay. Maybe my migraine's messing with me. Why isn't my sister in the room? And I watch as both of their faces turn to horror as they see behind me, a man coming around the corner. He had been in the room with me while I was showering. Um, long story short, he, a struggle in trying to leave. He gave me all kinds of, gave us all kinds of lies. I'm with room service. No, you're not. I'm, you know, he was not supposed to be in my room. And when he realized that we were angry and we weren't going to like, just say, ew, get out. He started to freak out. And so he started to try and wrestle with us to get past us to leave. And at that point, a full on fight broke out. Um, and the girl started running down the hallway. We were screaming. I was naked, um, which was even more humiliating and, and, and terrifying, like to think about how vulnerable of a state I actually was in, wet, naked on the floor already. Like by the grace of God, my mom just had that feeling to come check on me. But we were able to subdue him in the elevator bank until the police arrived. And when the police arrived, that's when I felt safe, but I automatically felt terror um, because the police were wonderful. They took him, but they allowed me to be a part of the process of looking at the things he had with him. So in his bag, there is what we think was a change of clothes for me, a cashmere blue kind of outfit. Um, what we think was a change of clothes for him, um, a blazer and a dress, dress shirt that would look like hotel security, a cleaning rag of some sort, a mask, face mask, and um, a ball cap, and a key to a hotel room at another hotel. And so once we realized, when, when the police we were looking through the bag and the police realized, they were like, all right, this is, drop it, don't touch this anymore. And they, it became a different type of investigation other than just like, a, maybe he was there to steal things or he's a peeping Tom, or he was trying to assault you. Um, the investigation has led to a little bit more information. I'm actually not supposed to talk a lot about it, but essentially I personally believe that his intention was to remove me from the property. Um, all the points point in that direction. Um, nothing was stolen. We had money out. We had electronics out. We had nice purses out. Nothing was stolen. And he had a hotel key card to my room with my room number written on it and none of mine were missing. So that was another thing. So at the beginning, when we first sat down, you mentioned to me that I am a survivor and I'm so grateful. Thank you so much. That's so sweet. I'm, I don't identify as a survivor of trafficking. I, I was a part of a very scary and traumatizing event, but I was spared. Um, yeah. By the grace of God, I it didn't go the direction that he had been planning, or that, um, or or how it goes for a lot of people. And um, the reality is, my story is very sensationalized. Um, 
it's kind of like that movie with Liam ne- Nielsen, Liam Neeson, Neeson. Mm-hmm. yeah, <laughs> taken. Yeah. Um, that's a very sensationalized story. And that stuff does happen. Like, obviously my story is true. I'm not making it up. There are people who do go missing for parking lots. There are people who do go missing, like uh, random abductions are a thing, but they are the vast, 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 vast minority, um, in stories of trafficking. And so, um, I, <laughs> I knew that the Lord was calling me to be loud about trafficking. And then he gave me this experience, this life experience where I realized that it's really, truly happening everywhere. It is, um, I think, I can't even, I don't even know if I wrote down the statistic, but how many billions of dollars the industry truly is. Um, We are worth a lot of money. And so it's truly happening all around us. And so the next morning I woke up We were leaving to go home from Miami and I went to the airport and I had just gone through security. It was pandemic, had my mask on, thought I'm just going to wash my hands after going through security. So I went to the bathroom, went to wash my hands. And when I looked up in the mirror and everything was foggy, because I mean, I was still in the shock from the night before, but this is one of the only things I really remember from the 24 hours after I washed my hands and I looked up in the mirror. And when I was looking in the mirror, there was this piece of paper, like a someone had taped paper over where my face should be. And so I like moved my face around and was looking at my hair and then went back to wash my hands and decided to actually read what was on the paper. And the paper had three photos of women on it. And it said, help us stop trafficking. If you see something, say something with the international trafficking hotline number there. And I was completely like the breath was completely taken away from me in that, um, in that moment, because I realized even that day, I was still looking around the paper. I was looking around the faces of the people who are most vulnerable and most exploited in the world. And I could have so easily been one of them. And so, I mean, it makes me emotional because I can't tell you how long I knew that trafficking was happening and I didn't want to go there. It was just too dirty, too dark, too scary. And I was looking around their faces, but then by the grace of God, I'm not one of those faces, truly only by the grace of God. My mom had this weird feeling to come check on me and thank God she did. So it became an act of faith for me. You know, I, I believe in, I'm a Christian. I believe in Jesus. Um, in Micah, it says, he has shown you, oh, mortal, what is good? This is Micah 6, 8. And what does the Lord require of you to act justly and love mercy and to walk humbly with your God um, and to act justly? I mean, I'm, it's easy for me to love mercy and, I, you know, I can walk humbly with God, but I don't want to act justly. I had, had launched this ministry before and I was just happy to share encouraging, happy verses. That's what I wanted to do. Tell people about Jesus and all the happy parts of it. But um we're called to a little bit more than that. We, we're supposed to love all of God's children. Um, Proverbs 31 is like the idea of like in, in the Christian world, it's like, that's what the woman, the Christian woman, um, the ideal Christian woman should be. Um, and it says Proverbs 31, eight through nine, she speaks up for those who cannot speak for themselves. She ensures justice for those being crushed. Yes, speak up and see that they get justice. So the ideal Christian women should also be speaking out for those who do not have a voice. And right now, God's children, about 40 million of them worldwide, don't have a voice because it's been taken away from them. They're enslaved. They're exploited. And um, I I can't remain silent any longer. And so uh, after some serious therapy (laughs) Um, and lots and lots of internal work. Um, I gained up the courage and I shared my story in May of 2021. And this is what I talk about now. (laughs) So, yeah, it's, it's incredible. Do you feel safe traveling today? Yeah, I do. I do. Now, does that mean I don't have like PTSD? No, for sure. Uh, Yeah. (laughs) Um, so the week after we went to Miami, um, I had an appointment with, I had an appointment with my mother in New York city. And so we were just going to fly out for a couple of nights and 
I talked to my therapist and I was like, I'm not going. It's only been about a week and a half. I'm not going. And she said, you have to rip the bandaid. You got to go. So it's just my mom and me and two of my sisters went. And in the middle of the night, my mom and I woke up both like, there's someone in the room. I mean, like crazy PTSD, but um, we've traveled a lot since then. I have to remember that of all the times I've traveled, this is the one instance and knowledge is power. And I'm now know to do specific safety checks in my hotel room before I go in it and um, other things like that. Yeah. Yeah. So do you think, are there any signs that people need to be on the lookout for either for spotting others potentially in a trafficking attempt or for yourself and for your own personal safety? Like you mentioned, checking your hotel room or things to look out for. Absolutely. So let's talk trafficking first and then we'll talk personal safety. Sure. Then, yeah, you know, sure. Trafficking is a, one of the things that personal safety you want to like <laughs> fight against, but um, really there's a lot, there's a lot of different numbers. So the very first thing with trafficking in order to understand um, what it looks like, you have to understand trafficking more. So like I said, stories like mine are very, very few and far between. Um, they do happen clearly, but they're few and far between. The vast majority of people are trafficked by people that they know and that they trust, either a family member or a boyfriend or someone who's promising a job um, for them. It, the top five access points um, are family members, significant others. I said five, but it's three, um, and people offering a job. So that's, that's really where... Um, people get get caught up in this and so it's it, it it looks a lot different it looks a lot like um a prostitute who believed her boyfriend loved her and he convinced her to run away because she was under you know young and underage and her parents were you know over overbearing so now it looks like she's living a life she's chosen for herself but she hasn't chosen it. It looks a lot like a child whose um, grandmother for extra money is pimping a child out on the weekends um, or in, in the hours that they're not in school. So the, ra- the reality is it's happening all around us all the time. And so when you know that and you see that, then you can best understand what the um, red flags might look like. So you've got... Um, majority of people who are, who are trafficked are trafficked. They're chosen because of their vulnerabilities. Um, so what are the kind of top vulnerabilities would be uh, a history of abuse, socioeconomic, they're, um, you know, below the poverty line, runaways, foster children are of the highest, um, like the highest vulnerability. Um, so, when you can see that the, these people are trafficked, they're chosen for their vulnerabilities, then we can start looking for, so who are the vulnerable that I should be looking for, who, that I should be speaking for, that I should be advocating for. And so um, so you see it kind of happening that way a lot more than um, you know white girl in the parking lot of Target, um, skin color or not, um, are chosen because of their all, what already makes them vulnerable. Um, so, What'll often happen is somebody like a boyfriend, a family member, a someone offering a job will then um, exploit them through substance abuse, uh, physical abuse, sexual abuse, intimidation, emotional abuse, um, and they'll withhold paying or earnings if it's labor trafficking. Um, they'll threat to report them to immigration. So these people are very much worn down and terrified. And so when you're looking for something, if you're looking for signs, you look for um, someone who's not speaking, a woman who, if, um, if you man and woman enter and she's not speaking for herself, she's she seems scared or quiet or um, not able to, she just seems vulnerable or scared. And listen, trust your gut, like, right? I mean, I, my mom trusted her gut and it, and it led to my savings. So trust your gut. If you're looking at this and it seems shady to you, call the trafficking hotline. Like it's, what's the worst thing that's going to happen? Like you look like a crazy person, but you go home and you never see those people again, trust your gut and do what you think, um, you know, would, would save this person. So things to look out for, um, tattoos, like branding, specifically a barcode. If you see a barcode tattooed on, on a woman, that's a really good, um, 
you know, sign that somebody has been, you know, truly saying their mind to sell. Um, so things like that, uh, 40 million victims worldwide, that's one in every 200 people. Um, it's a really low risk. It's really high profit. These people are hidden in plain sight um, and people fall into it. And so a lot of times we think that this is a life that someone's chosen for themselves when realistically they're not, especially underage victims, um, especially, especially. So if you, um, this is when it gets really sketchy. Uh, if you know anyone who has hired an escort or hired a prostitute, uh, chances are they have come in contact with someone who is trafficking or a victim of trafficking. Um, it is just that it's just happening all over. Yeah. Um, furthermore, yeah. we're going to take it a step further and, um, know that, that, human trafficking, sex trafficking specifically, um, goes even further into digital trafficking. And so um, something like 80, 80 something percent, I had the statistic written down, but 80, I think it's 80% of women who were in trafficking, um, who were victims of trafficking said that porn was made of them while they were being trafficked. And something about 35 to 40% of pornography that you would see online is porn that's made non-consensually exploitative porn of um, somebody who's being victimized. And so that if you've interacted with porn, you've interacted with trafficking. Um, unfortunately, very few people have interacted with porn and have not interacted with exploitation of somebody in some sense. Um, and so how can we help stop it? So I say that the top three things that we can do to help stop it. Number one, education. Start researching. It's, it's heavy. It's dark. It's ugly. But education is the number one way that we can start to change. Because once you know what to look for, then you can look for it. Um, I was a teacher for four years, a high school teacher. And I have a student who I can still see to this day, beautiful girl. And now knowing what I know, I believe she was probably a victim of trafficking in the hours outside of school. I didn't know it then. I didn't know what to look for. I knew something was wrong. My gut was telling me something, but you know, how do you, how do you get a 16 or 17 year old girl to tell you what's wrong? It, unless I knew what to look for, what to ask for. But I truly believe she was at school from 7.30 AM to 2.30 PM and then from 2.30 p.m. until she was home at dinner time, someone was trafficking her. And then the cycle started all over again. Um, so educate yourself, but most importantly, um, educate yourself by listening to survivors, listening to women, men who have come out of trafficking and who are saying, this is what's really happening. This is what it's like. This is what you need to look for. These are the red flags because as much as I can tell you what I've learned, they know it better. And they're the, they're the people we should be listening to. And we should be modeling our anti-trafficking push um, after. So number one is education. Number two, donate. I mean, there is not an anti-trafficking organization in the world, large or small, that that is not going to benefit from your money, $5 or $5,000. They say during the pandemic, trafficking cases grew by 20 to 40%. Wow. That means, yeah, oh, absolutely. If you think about people who are already vulnerable, right? Mm -hmm. Now are even more so vulnerable. And children who were vulnerable, who, sh who were in school, safe during those hours of the day, are even more so vulnerable. And so it's just, since it has increased people's vulnerabilities, it has increased the ability to exploit those vulnerabilities. And, and, and vulnerability could also be a teenage child who feels bullied at school, sitting in their room online, you know, getting to know someone who's actually grooming her. So, um, you can get to know a stranger that they think is a friend, you know? Um, so it's increased, it's increased by, by a lot. And 
unfortunately, a lot of these small um, local organizations where I say is the number one place to get involved, because there's one in your community that there's an organization in your community, no matter where you live, that is fighting trafficking, that is helping victims and survivors of trafficking um, to regain control of their lives and to get out of it. Um, because the reality is 80% of these women that are rescued we're gonna put that in quotations, rescued from trafficking, will fall right back into the hands of their trafficker again because there no one is helping them end the vulnerabilities that they had in the first place, right? So the cycle continues and they're becoming more vulnerable because now they have PTSD and this trauma from being trafficked and they just fall right back into the hands of their trafficker because that life is a life they know and understand. And, and when, you're, when you're dealing with trauma, um, something you know and understand, even if it is traumatic, feels safer. Um, and so donate, give back to these organizations that are absolutely um, doing everything they can to rejuvenate and help these victims recover, um, these survivors. I'm not gonna call them victims, they're survivors. Um, so anything that's a survivor first organization, donate your time, donate your talents, donate your money, do whatever you can. If you have a law background, help, Help them help their survivors gain custody of their kids again. Help them help these survivors um, do what they need to do to get an apartment. You know, whatever it is, if you have a finance background, you can help somebody get back on their feet again. Um, and that's what these women need the most. Um, and men. And the third thing is to know the signs and know how to report. Um, and so all of this, I post all the time on my Instagram, Chandler.Hatchet, just look at what, what do you look for? Um, but your gut was given to you by God, right? We all have it. Your gut feeling that like nudging, that pushing. And if you're a Christian, you know, that's coming from the Holy spirit. Um, that's given to you by God. We got to follow it. Um, I would have absolutely been a victim if my mother didn't follow her gut and she felt that nudging and she felt that I need to go do something about it. And it's weird to be a woman who's going to go check on your 33 year old daughter. Who's just a few feet away from you in the hotel room, right? It's weird to go up to the front desk and say, I need a security officer. I think that girl's being trafficked. It's weird to tell your flight attendant, this is not right when I'm seeing back here. Um, that's all weird, but my mom's answer to the nudging in her heart saved me and we can be that for somebody else. Absolutely. Yeah. And then to answer your question on personal safety and the things that I've learned from this, um, the very first thing is on Amazon expensive. There's this little key that you can put in your door and lock it from the inside. Um, that I've I bought one for myself. It's just, it, it's going to add that next level of security for you. Um, and then always do like the chain across the door or the bolt across the door, no matter what, if you're inside the room, don't ever just let the door close and assume that's locked enough. Cause that's what I did. I didn't put the bolt on. Um, the second thing is if you go into a hotel room, I would urge you, especially ideally not to go in the hotel room alone, but if you're staying alone, try and search and look under the beds. He was, uh, he had gone to hide in the closet. So um, he was like crouched down between the bed and the closet. So just do a quick look around the room just to, you know, ease your mind. Um, but then other than that, be aware, don't be afraid to t tell someone no if they offer you to buy you a drink and you feel weird feelings from them. Um, don't leave the bar with someone you just met. Just don't do it. Um, I, I didn't like my story is really crazy, but a lot of people do. And um, I will tell you the man that approached me was, he was handsome. He was clean cut. He smelled good. He was well-dressed looked just like he belonged in the lobby of a five-star hotel. If I was younger and not married and he had offered to buy me a drink at a bar, I absolutely would have said yes. He smelled good. He looked, he looked nice, clean cut, you know, well, well dressed. And so I would urge women accepting a drink from him is one thing, but leaving the bar with him would be another. And so I just, we just live in a day and an age where we have to be on guard. We 
walking around. It's not weird to ask a security guard to walk you to your car. It's not weird to call and be on the phone with your mom while you're walking in the parking lot. Like, do what you have to do. Do not live in fear because fear doesn't get us anywhere. But knowledge is power. And if you can look around and you see someone that's making you uncomfortable, make eye contact with them and tell them to stop. Be, be rude. <laughs> do it. Because if they think you don't notice, don't be on your phones all the time. Like if, if, if they think you notice, that's going to be a, a deterrent already. Because this man, once he realized we weren't like the, the natural reaction would be like, oh my God, get out. Right. He would have gotten away and there would have been another victim. But we made eye contact with him. We were like, you sit down. I mean, there were lots of cuss words said. And when he didn't, when he realized we weren't going to let him leave, that's when the struggle ensued. And so, um, surprise people by being firm, by being aware and by being loud. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah. So, uh, that would be my personal safety, um, encouragement. And, um, I, I mean, I have my concealed handgun license, so, you know, I take it. <laughs> Being that you and I are both mothers also and moms of young kids, young girls, it probably makes all of our fellow mamas uh, feel instantly nauseous to even think about, but we have to because that's real life. So what have you come across or learned or what do you think is the most important and valuable things that are must knows as parents, as we help our kids navigate the real world and not instill fear in them where they're, you know, too, where it's too soon or whatever, but also keeping them safe and giving them, you know, all of the tools that they need to stay safe and giving us the tools that we need to keep them as safe as possible. Yeah. Um, when I talk about how to, to work with our children to help keep them safe, I, I address it in two different ways. Digital safety is the number one, mm -hmm. number one priority. Children have access to way too much through the World Wide Web. Yeah. Um, they, and the reality is we have to help our children understand how to navigate it correctly. Um, but those conversations begin at the same age as our daughters, which they're three years old. I, we need to start talking to our children about good pictures, bad pictures what to do when you see a bad picture, things like that. Or um, internet safety, I, the amount of exploitation that's happening in the DMs of apps like Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, um, mm -hmm. much, yeah, much less to see um, a cultural movement, this shift towards um, having women do dance moves, having little girls do dance moves that... Um, further exploitation, um, further gross expectations of sexual ideas. Um, and so we have to be really diligent about how we allow our children to interact with, te interact with technology and how much of it they're allowed to be exposed to or to see. The reality is the average child in sees porn in the United States by the age of six. So that's my son's about to turn seven. Um, and so, and that's the average, right? Um, what that means is it brings me to the second point, the second talking point. We need to be talking about porn because porn is highly addictive. It changes our brain chemistry. Um, our young children are accessing it and seeing it and they're seeing violent porn, like I said, at least 30, 40%, you're seeing the rape and exploitation of trafficking victims. So this is what our children's first interaction with any idea of sexual intimacy is before they even have their first kiss or they hold hands with somebody. Like, no wonder there's a culture of, of children hurting each other and hurting themselves. Um, and, and rape is so prominent, especially in college campuses. So so what happens with porn is that not only are we talking, we talked about this earlier, that porn creates 
and provide or trafficking creates and provides content for pornography, right? But the experience of pornography drives forward the demand for more trafficking because what happens is you see this experience, you see this experience, you see this experience. Well, that's no longer filling the need that it used to, your body is going to want more. And so now people are hiring sex. And so that's what it does in the life cycle of someone who's been consistently um, interacting with porn and consuming porn. Eventually that's going to drive the demand for hiring a sex worker, which we know a vast majority of our sex workers are actually being trafficked. And so um, there are some that do choose that lifestyle, but a very large majority are not. And so we have to consider that um, with pornography. And so talking with our children about porn openly, talking about almost as if it's like drugs. And, and there's an organization that I love called Fight the New Drug. They literally talk about it as a drug. We should be having open conversations with our children. If you see somebody interacting with porn in a sleepover, you have to be able to tell me they're not going to get in trouble. You're not going to get in trouble. We need to talk about it in our families. And those conversations start really, really young. Um, I had somebody, I saw somebody ask uh, someone who's outspoken about this, what age is the right age to give my child a phone? And that person responded with whatever age you're happy with your child seeing porn. And that really just stuck me in the stomach because, you know, that, that I know, I know 12 year olds, 10 year olds, nine year olds who have their smartwatches and things like that. But the reality is, is they have access to the whole wide world, the good, yeah. good and the bad. And so we have to help them navigate that. And, and, and I really do want to say as much as this is heavy and hard to talk about, I do think that our generation, the millennial generation, we have a really awesome opportunity. We were the first generation to be like cyber bullied. We were the first generation to have like, you know, AIM and sent messenger. Like we know we know, we knew at a young age not to give our address out online, right? We it was our generation that had to learn that, and so we are in a really unique position, probably more so than any generation before us. My husband's ten years older than me, so like we're even he and I are on different wavelengths on like what I know versus what he knows and what I experience versus what he experienced because you know he didn't get a computer until after college, um, so they had beepers, you know, but we have a really unique opportunity. I think we are the generation that can help our, our children and help our youth engage appropriately online. Um, so I'm really encouraged by that. Yeah, for sure. How, from what you have seen and from what you know and everything, I feel like there's probably some people listening where when they hear those statistics and they hear how early kids are experiencing porn and coming into contact with it going, well, that won't be my kid or I'll, they, they won't see it because of X, Y, Z. So how do you think they are, how are they actually coming into contact with it? Is, is it them searching for it? People sending it to them? Like what are, what are the sorts of things, especially beyond just putting parental controls on your kid's device that can kind of be some sort of gridlock there yeah. or starting that process to, to stop it? My first response to somebody who would say that is, um, let's just say they have a child who does have an Instagram account. I would say right now, open up your own personal Instagram account and type in 18 plus into the search bar and see what comes up. And don't tell me your child is not going to have access to porn. Um, when I was a teacher, this was five years ago, six years ago. They told us majority of our students are on Twitter. So we want our teachers to open Twitter accounts so you can send out reminders for homework, quizzes, tests, things like that. And I opened up a Twitter account and so never really had one. Don't really see the point of it. It just seems like a lot of drama. And um, my students followed me. I followed them because it was, I used it to give out reminders for their Spanish class. And I opened up Twitter and then started scrolling through and saw a pornographic video, hardcore pornographic video. One of my students reposted it. Huh. Oh my God. And it was on this account called sexual gifs and it was gifs. So it was like a, just like a boom, almost a boomerang that this is not like, you don't have to type in your birthday. Like I wasn't even searching for porn. And 
then my heart sank because I realized I am a 23 year old woman and I know how to handle this and I want to turn it off. But how do you tell a 14 year old boy to unfollow their friend or to block their friend's tweets or somebody else at school, or they're not even looking for it and that's changing their brain chemistry. And so um, that would be my next anecdote for that. And the third thing is it, your child may not be, what probably the first time they interact with porn, it's not because they're gonna search for it. It's because someone's gonna show them on the school bus, on their, on their friend's smartphone, at a sleepover, um, in, at school, on their phone, if they're just connected to 5G and they're not connected to Wi-Fi, um, all kinds of that. And I wanna tell you on Twitter, I was on the school computer, at on the school's internet with that Twitter. And that was just happening on Twitter. I mean, I'm telling you, there's no way your child is not gonna interact with porn. It's just not gonna happen. You can do everything you can to protect them, yes, but you have to be talking to them about what to do when they interact with porn, because it's not a matter of if, but when. Um, and so you can't, I like actually drew this Venn diagram because I was like, where does it, where, where do the conversations naturally go? When I start talking about trafficking, I then start talking about porn because they, the porn absolutely drives the demand for trafficking and trafficking provides content for porn. And then it automatically goes into that third category, that Venn diagram of how do I, how do I take care of my child and keep my child safe? And so um, to, to say my child will never, interact with that that is absolutely naive and I'm I'm gonna go so far as to say it's poor parenting <laughs> I don't think that person who says it is a bad parent but I don't think it's a great parenting practice yeah. um unfortunately well because ignorance is not bliss in this situation it's absolutely not. the opposite <laughs> absolutely. so yeah we it's our responsibility as parents to be aware of the full context of everything that we need to be aware of if there's any hope of protecting or anything with our children. Like you have yeah. to know, you have to know better to do better and be better. So. Right. And I think I've never met a parent who doesn't know that. Um, I, I, I met parents who think, Oh, my, so we're so far so good. Um, but I, I've never met a parent who's like, no, I won't need to. So I will say I do like, like I said, I am encouraged by our generation, uh, of young parents that we are, we're like, no, nope, mm, this happened to us. Like, we're not gonna let this happen to our kids, you know, mm -hmm. but we have to do something about it. And it's hard work. And any, any good parenting requires so much more effort than you even ever imagined when you were pregnant. <laughs> oh yeah. Hard work, but important work. And I think the good work, it's the work that I think we were all called and equipped to be able to handle. So I think it's, it's just time to, um, accept that and rise to the occasion and, and do it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, for sure. Well, Chandler, thank you so much for sharing your story with everyone on thrive. I want to wrap things up by asking you something I ask all guests on thrive. And that is what does thrive mean to you and how do you strive to thrive in your everyday life? Oh man, that's a great question. Thriving for me means walking closely with Jesus because when I am tied to the word and tied to him in prayer, the flowing out in my life allows me to thrive as a mother, as a sister, as a daughter, as a friend, um, as someone with a platform. So uh, that's what thriving means to me. Amazing. Tell everyone where they can find you online to connect with you more. And if you have any personal favorite, uh, organizations, Instagram accounts, anything that you think people should follow along with go to right after listening to this, tell us those as well. Yes. Okay. So you can find me at chandler.hatchet on Instagram. Um, and I, I actually list out often my favorite accounts to follow. You do, uh, I, you do a good job of it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. I, I love fight the new drug. If you want to learn more about the negative effects of porn, um, by the way, if you do consistently consume porn, uh, you are not a bad person at all. There is no shame in that. Um, but this is a really good opportunity. It's a new year, a new month. It's anti, uh, it's trafficking prevention and awareness month. This is a great time to understand what we're consuming, um, and where it's coming from and how we can actually make a difference by maybe just 
stopping it. Um, and so that's a great, that's a great organization to follow. Um, the Tim Tebow Foundation, A21. Um, and then obviously, of course, the very best thing you can do is Googling, um, Googling organizations in your community, in your city that are changing lives for trafficking survivors um, and funding them following them, sharing them with other people. Those are the number one. I, I cannot urge us enough to like put hands and feet to our own communities because it really is happening everywhere. Um, so yeah, that's what I would say. <laughs> Wait, before you go, make sure you're subscribed to never miss an episode of Thrive. Drop five stars on your way out if you like what you just listened to and come join the party on Instagram at thrive.podcast to stay inspired and thriving all week long. Thanks for tuning in. It's your time to thrive.